Americans. Uh, and as they are debating this question of whether to go to war with Mexico, uh, Representative David Wilmot, a Democrat, a member of Polk's party, uh, kind of upsets the apple cart by throwing into the mix a uh, proposal that slavery should be banned in any new territory acquired from Mexico. Uh, Wilmot was an anti-slavery Democrat, uh, and he didn't want to see slavery spread to additional territory. Uh, this proposal, you know, kind of threw everybody for a loop. The last thing these guys wanted to be talking about was slavery. Uh, they managed to beat it down, and uh, the Wilmot Proviso, as it was called, did not pass. Uh, but what it did do is it highlighted the fact that even though the party leaders didn't want to talk about slavery, uh, there were a lot of people in the country who did. Uh, and when you've got a lot of people in the country who want to talk about something that the party leaders don't want to talk about, uh, that's when you start getting into a new party system. Now, <clears throat> at the end of the Mexican War, you know, Texas, it had already always had slavery. Uh, from the time that it was founded by sort of cotton planters who had come over from the United States. Uh, so there was not much question that Texas was going to be a slave state. Uh, and Oregon, in turn, you know, was mostly settled by uh, people from the uh, north. Uh, they didn't really have slavery up there. Uh, it wasn't farmland that lended itself to large plantations. So slavery wasn't really going to be an issue in Oregon. Um, California was going to be maybe a little more complicated, but Congress figured they could punt that issue. Uh, you know, it was going to take years, years before there would be enough people in California to, uh, you know, be talking about statehood. Uh, and then somebody, you know, happened to find gold laying on the ground, just like that. And uh, in a matter of less than a year, uh, you've got the required 30,000 people living in California. Uh, and they are interested in becoming a state. And that means the whole question of slavery is going to have to be settled. And that's gonna require some compromise. Um, the sort of pattern that had been around ever since, uh, you know, 1789, when admitting new states uh, was they came in in pairs. Uh, you admitted a free state and a slave state at the same time. Uh, that was important to keeping the balance in the Senate, remember, where each state has uh, equal representation, uh, and it also affects the Electoral College in uh, electing presidents. Now, as long as you had, you know, the cotton boom and additional cotton land coming into the country, that all made perfect sense. Uh, and, you know, you had the Missouri Compromise, which pretty much drew the line at the northern reaches of where cotton would grow. Uh, but there's also a western boundary to where cotton will grow. And when you get about halfway across Texas, uh, it starts to get too dry to raise cotton. So this land acquired from Mexico uh, isn't really going to be cotton land. Um, and slavery there for cotton isn't a thing. Uh, but the slave states still need to maintain that balance. Uh, and so to do that, it's gonna require kind of changing the paradigm. Um, but changing the paradigm is going to change the nature of slavery. Uh, everybody had kind of gotten comfortable with cotton plantations using slaves. Uh, but if we're going to start talking about, you know, mining operations using slaves and other kind of farming operations using slaves, uh, that's really changing the nature of slavery in the United States in ways that people aren't necessarily prepared for. Uh, but this isn't a question that Congress can just kick down the road. Uh, California wants to be a state, and they're not going to wait. The result of this is going to be the Compromise of 1850. Uh, California is going to become a free state. Uh, Texas is going to uh, get slightly reduced in size so that slavery doesn't extend to, to too much of an area. They're going to ban the slave trade in D.C., which was a little something for the uh, you know, anti-slavery uh, forces. Although the part of DC, city of Alexandria, where the uh, main slave market was, that had already gone back to Virginia. So banning the slave trade in DC was just kind of a formality. Uh, the big thing that the South is gonna get out of this is a new improved fugitive slave law. 
the original Constitution fugitive slave provision uh, allowed state courts uh, to deal with the problem of uh, masters who wanted to reacquire their uh, escaped property. Uh, and a lot of, uh, particularly in New England, courts were very not favorable to people from Virginia or elsewhere uh, coming in and trying to recover slaves. Um, to address that, the Fugitive Slave Law was going to take this into federal court uh, where it would be handled under different rules uh, outside the control of the northern states. Now, there's something in this compromise for everyone to hate. Uh, nobody really loved this thing except the politicians, uh, and they only liked it because they thought they had pretty much annoyed everybody equally and gotten a compromise that would stick. Uh, this was kind of Henry Clay's last uh, piece of political work. Uh, he's going to die shortly after this thing is adopted. Um, but they kind of, you know, Congress breathed a sigh of relief when they finally passed this thing and said, thank goodness we'll never have to talk about slavery ever again. Not so much. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Law was really, really unpopular in the North. Uh, especially in New England, where uh, they were very, very down on slavery. Uh, the abolitionist movement is going to get a huge leg up on this. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe up there in the corner is going to write a um, not particularly well-written novel uh, with a lot of, you know, sort of stereotypical versions of what the South is about. Um, but it was the first time that you really had a popular bestseller written from the viewpoint of a slave. Uh, and that made a big difference. That sort of turned this issue into something that people could identify with. Uh, and another thing people could identify with was the story of Anthony Burns down there in the lower right. Uh, he had escaped from uh, Virginia, from slavery. He'd established himself in Massachusetts with the help of abolitionists there. Uh, and then up comes his former master and, uh, you know, seizes him uh, and wants to take him back to Virginia. Uh, and this created a huge outcry in Boston. Uh, people in Boston regarded this as kidnapping. Uh, how could a free man be returned to slavery? How could a free man be enslaved in the United States? Gave a huge leg up to the abolitionist movement. There being, particularly in New England, becoming less of a bunch of extremist cranks and more and more of a mainstream position. Uh, meanwhile, the Whig Party is going to sort of go its way into history. Um, with Jackson gone, with the parties, you know, gradually working out uh, ideas on the uh, economic issues, the economics are no longer as much of an issue, Jackson isn't an issue. Uh, there's no real reason to support the Whigs anymore, and a big reason not to support them is they're responsible for the hated Compromise of 1850. Uh, so uh, President uh, Fillmore down there in the corner is going to be the last, uh, having signed the Compromise of 1850, he is going to be the last of the Whig presidents. But that's not necessarily going to automatically be good news for the South, because the other thing that's happening in this period is the South is continuing to lose political power. Uh, you know, in the, in the old days, the Virginia dynasty pretty much controlled everything. Um, but in the second party system, they had to, you know, power was passing down into the cotton zones and it was spread around the whole South. After 1852, it became clear that uh, the Democrats couldn't elect a president who was a Southerner. Uh, they had to nominate Northerners, but they had to nominate Northerners who were not offensive to the South. Uh, and so you get uh, two of the least effective presidents in American history, uh, Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire and James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, no pow Northern power is increasing in the House, uh, which is based on population due to all of that immigration. And in this comes the uh, need for railroad expansion to California, the Transcontinental Railroad. This guy in the picture, uh, Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, wants that railroad to go in that center route from Chicago to uh, San Francisco. 
Um, but that's not going to happen unless he gets some Southern votes. Uh, the Southerners would prefer a railroad that goes to New Orleans. Uh, and Douglas is going to have to give them something to get them to support his railroad. The something that he's going to give them is the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, the idea that Kansas and Nebraska, uh, which are north of the Missouri Compromise Line, uh, are going to have the opportunity to vote on whether to be slave states or free states. Now, Douglas doesn't think this is a very big deal. He thinks there's no way that slavery is going to pass there. He's just kind of throwing a bone to the South by opening the possibility of slavery. Uh, but it turns out things are more complicated. When abolitionists find out that there's going to be a vote in Kansas on whether it will be a slave state or a free state, uh, a lot of abolitionists uh, are going to move to Kansas to be part of that vote. Uh, and they are going to be funded by wealthy abolitionists from New England. Uh, and the Southerners are not going to take this lying down. Uh, Southerners from Missouri are going to cross over uh, and also vote in the Kansas election. Uh, and they're going to be able to do this because the Democrats in Washington don't really want, um, they don't really want Kansas uh, to be a free state. They would kind of like Kansas to be a slave state uh, that would make everything sort of much easier politically. Uh, so they're going to look the other way while all of this uh, faulty and fraudulent voting is going on. Uh, but that's just going to make the abolitionists even more angry. And eventually folks are going to be shooting at each other uh, and trying to drive each other out of Kansas, hence bleeding Kansas. Out of this drama associated with the Kansas-Nebraska Act is going to come a new political party. Um, and it's going to be made up of a couple of different groups. Uh, you've got abolitionists who we know want to end slavery everywhere, uh, and some of them want to do it immediately. Uh, and then a different group, the Free Soilers. Now, the Free Soilers don't want slavery to expand to the West. They are mostly made up of uh, people who were Democrats. Uh, but now that the territory has been acquired, they're no longer in agreement with the uh, slave interests. They want the territory for themselves uh, and not to go with, uh, not to be open to slavery. It's, it's a very Jacksonian position, this idea that, you know, the, the small farmer uh, doing his own work uh, is going to have a leg up on acquiring this territory rather than this, you know, rich slave plantation owner who is going to exploit other the work of others to line his own pockets uh, to the detriment of the small farmer. Um, and so you're, the Free Soiler is really a group that's splitting off from the Democrats uh, and finding a home in this new party. But they don't necessarily agree with the abolitionists on the question of whether slavery should be ended in the South. Free Soilers don't really care about that. Uh, they're interested only in the West. Uh, and then you're going to have some former Whigs jump onto this thing because they're looking for a vehicle. Um, the Whigs know that all by themselves, their economic agenda isn't going anywhere. Uh, but if they can attach themselves to a new party, uh, they might have a chance. And so this unwieldy coalition of uh, people who only really agree on one thing, which is slavery should not be allowed to expand to new territory, they're going to form the Republican Party. Uh, and it's going to make a play for national power and to do it without any Southern support. The Republican Party is going to be a coalition of Northerners and Westerners uh, in opposition to the South. Now, the South doesn't like this and the South does not like which direction things are going. Uh, it's getting clearer and clearer that it's gonna be really hard to uh, make any more slave states in existing American territory. Uh, so they start looking at the possibility of acquiring new territory uh, like Cuba or maybe Central America, places where you know, slave plantations would be more economically viable. Uh, the Republicans aren't having any of this. The so-called Ostend Manifesto, uh, which was a plan to uh, get Cuba one way or the other, uh, the Republicans made clear they were gonna vote this down. Uh, 
no chance of this whatsoever. Um, in the midst of all this, the Supreme Court is going to weigh in. Now, the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford is an interesting case. I don't really have time to go into it in detail. Uh, but the main gist of it is this uh, Dred Scott uh, had been held as a slave in Missouri. Uh, he had been taken to Illinois uh, and then brought back to Missouri. And then years after the fact, he's going to court with the help of some abolitionists, claiming that when he set foot on free territory, he became a free man. Uh, and once he was a free man, he could not be re-enslaved in the United States. Uh, the Supreme Court, which at that point uh, had a majority of Southerners, uh, not only rejected Scott's claim, but they went way beyond what was actually necessary to settle this particular case, uh, which is something the Supreme Court isn't supposed to do. Uh, they ruled that slaves are definitely property all the way and not people at all. Uh, they ruled that even free blacks are not citizens of the United States uh, and do not have the right to bring cases in federal court. Uh, and they ruled that Congress could not ban slavery in a territory, uh, effectively rejecting the entire Missouri Compromise. Um, this was really a move to, uh, you know, draw a line in the sand uh, and expand the power of slavery. Uh, and it backfires in a big way because there's such a reaction against this. Uh, it's going to end up motivating even more free soilers to support the Republican Party. And the Republican Party is going to say, we don't care what the Supreme Court says. We are going to stop the spread of slavery no matter what it takes. Uh, and that's going to be a big deal. And then we get to this guy, John Brown. Uh, he's an abolitionist. Um, he'd been sort of radicalized in Kansas, involved in all the violence there. He comes up with this plan to start a slave revolt in Virginia, hoping that the result of this will be armed conflict throughout the South and eventual immediate abolition of slavery. Um, it was a pretty half-baked scheme, but he did get far enough to seize the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, uh, which is about... Uh, you know, 50 miles upriver from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, there he was sort of captured by the army uh, and put on trial for treason. And at that trial, it became clear that he had had financial support from a lot of prominent abolitionists in New England, uh, people who were active in the Republican Party. Uh, and this really sent shockwaves through the South. Um, this was, for a lot of Southerners, this was kind of the last straw. They are associating the Republican Party with the most radical of radical elements in uh, the abolitionist movement. Uh, and, you know, they've pretty much been poked in their most sensitive spot, which is their fear of a slave revolt. Um, so it's going to be a lot harder for them to accept the possibility of being ruled by the Republican Party. And that's going to take us to the election of 1860. Uh, the Democrats are, the Democratic convention that year is going to completely break down. Uh, they will be unable to agree on a single candidate. Uh, they're going to end up with two candidates. The Northern Democrats are, are going to nominate uh, Stephen Douglas. The Southern Democrats are going to nominate uh, John C. Breckinridge, the sitting vice president. Uh, the Southern Democrats are basically saying with this, we are no longer going to play around with trying to find Northerners who will support our interests. We're going to do our thing and be proud of it. Um, there's kind of two different flavors, well, maybe three different flavors of Southern Democrats. Uh, there are what they call the fire eaters who wanted to secede. They wanted the country to fall apart. They thought the South would be better off on its own and they're doing everything they can to make that happen. Uh, there are sort of the moderates uh, who think it's okay to threaten to secede, um, but that's only a way to get leverage uh, to work out a better compromise. Uh, and then there are the unionists who think that all of this talk of secession is, uh, is crazy talk, uh, and what they really need to be doing is working out some kind of a compromise. Uh, those three groups cannot come together and agree on a single presidential candidate, and that's going to create an opening for the Republicans uh, who are going to 
come to agreement on their candidate, Abraham Lincoln. Now, Lincoln is going to be a really good candidate for them because he's a relatively unknown fellow. He hasn't taken a position on a lot of issues. Uh, he's from the West, uh, which is going to be good because, uh, you know, they need as much help as they can get. Illinois was a big state with a lot of votes. Uh, Lincoln was pretty much a moderate on the slavery issue. Uh, he's a free soiler, but not an abolitionist. Um, the other major candidate in this race uh, is going to be this guy, John Bell. Uh, and he really represents a movement of kind of the political establishment of the time. Uh, the establishment politicians were horrified uh, that this election was breaking down into an election over slavery. Uh, and what they were hoping to do to try to cobble together one more compromise was to force the presidential election into the House of Representatives by denying any candidate a majority of the electoral votes. Uh, because they felt like once it went into the House of Representatives, the politicians would be in charge again and they could do what politicians do. Uh, so Bell was floated out as a candidate, not with the idea that he was going to win, but with the idea that he was going to get take enough electoral votes away from Lincoln uh, to make it possible for this thing to go in this, into the House uh, and probably be engineered into a victory for Douglas. Well, it didn't work out that way, um, but only by a little bit. Uh, Lincoln ended up being getting most of the electoral votes from the North, uh, although the state that was really critical for Lincoln was New York, uh, at the time the most populous state in the country. Uh, and in New York, out of you know over 4 million votes cast, uh, Lincoln won by only 1% of the popular vote in New York. And 50,136 votes gone for anybody other than uh, Lincoln, uh, particularly, uh, well, it wasn't, Douglas wasn't even on the ballot in New York. It was, you were voting for Lincoln or for electors who promised not to vote for Lincoln. Uh, and they kind of left it open as to who, you know, assuming that throw it into the house and deal with it there. Uh, 50,000 votes made all the difference. Lincoln wins an absolute majority of the electoral vote. And when you look at that total, it looks like a pretty decisive win, but it's relatively small. It's all in New York. Uh, and so the race isn't going to go into the House of Representatives. Lincoln is going to be the new president of the United States. Uh, and that proved to be something the South absolutely could not tolerate. Um, there's a convention held in South Carolina, always the most radical of the slave states. Uh, they vote to secede from the Union before Lincoln is sworn in. They want nothing of it. Uh, and over the next few weeks, again, after the election, but before the inauguration, uh, the other cotton states are going to vote to secede. Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. Uh, in Texas, the vote was close, uh, but Texas still voted to leave the Union. Now, at this point, uh, it's still not entirely clear. Is this just a threat to uh, set up a political negotiating position or is this for real? Uh, nobody's entirely sure. And uh, when we get to the next uh, step of this, uh, we're going to get into how that sorts itself out. So thank you for listening uh, and we'll be back again with more.